Hello everyone, welcome to another of these lockdown chats. Today I want to talk about modernity and I want to do that in a few ways. First of all, we're going to look at what modernity is. Uh, then we're going to look at the shock of modernity briefly. Um, a video I made uh, a couple of months ago, if not more. Third, I want to talk briefly about Foucault, the plague, modernity uh, in reference to this current pandemic. Uh, and finally, briefly, I want to talk about my next video, The Fist of Modernity. Um, so before we get started, if you enjoy these videos, these slightly more relaxed, informal videos, please do let me know in the comments. Um, I will be doing less of them and returning to my usual format, but I think in the future, I do also want to maybe make a normal video and then follow it the next week with a extra discussion and maybe dive into something uh, from the video a bit further. So let me know what you think about that. Remember to subscribe, hit that bell, and please do like and share. Um, it really helps the channel out. But let's get stuck in. First of all, what is modernity? Modernity is both a period of time and a attitude, a disposition. Um, it's a period of time really um, that is ongoing and that started most people say around the French Revolution um, and really defined itself with the Western push towards industrialization. Um, but it's also an attitude to be modern. Um, you know, to be modern is to use uh, technology and live in cities. So you could say it's a period that's ongoing, but you could say also that not everyone uh, living in this period lives in a modern way. Um, so modernity is positioned against custom, tradition, um, accepted ways of doing things, received wisdom, um, and it positions itself against that really with the scientific method at its centre. Um, modernity is about a blank slate, it's about uh, induction, it's about collecting facts and creating models and ways of doing things and improving human life with those facts. Um, in this sense then, modernity is a project. Um, it's an ongoing project that's about efficiency, um, that's about improving human life, um, and it's about searching for principles that are universal. Um, for example, looking at gravity and then using that to build machines that will improve uh, our, our, our ability to, to farm food, etc. Um, so modernity, in a sense, is a project. Um, and it's a project that really starts from the position of a blank slate that says humans are able to build from a zero point from scratch. I have my problems with this, but I will shelf that for a while, um, well, for the purposes, for this, purposes of this video, at least. Um, and we can see this in John Locke, for example, um, one of the forefathers of modernity, who said in his two treatises on governments that in the beginning, all the world was America. And what he meant by that was that all the world was this blank canvas, this kind of Eden where humans could come and build and, and observe and, and, and create farms and industry out of it. And forget for a moment the irony that Locke fails to um, consider the Native Americans that already lived there. But for him, the entire world could be this Eden of America um, and this kind of typified um, a starting point for a modern attitude to life. Things that can spring from this are industrialization, urbanization, um, the growing uh, of industry and the coming together of people in a way that makes that industry more efficient. Um, secularization is similar to Locke's blank, blank slate in a way. It's forgetting the received wisdom of re religion, the custom, the old ways of doing things, and taking a human life as a blank slate that 
it can sketch its own life story into. You know, you decide the ethics and morals you want to follow. Um, you just don't, you don't take on your families or your communities or your churches. Um, so secularization uh, and systematization, bureaucratization, um, these are the things that make up both the modern period and uh, the disposition of the modern person. So that's the question of what modernity is. Um, and it's a topic I'd like to explore further in, in future videos because it's a topic I've been grappling with for a while now and everyone has a different angle on this. So do let me know what you think. I want to talk now briefly about the video I made a few months ago, The Shock of Modernity, um, which really took this period and, um, and argued that it was a shock to people that in the space of a generation or two, their whole lives had changed and uh, as a consequence, their whole consciousness and their attitude to life changed. And to some people, um, and to many people, in fact, this was a huge shock. This was anxiety inducing. Um, because if we see modernity as a project, it places a demand on the person. It places an empty space, a question mark. If I can change things, if I can make things more efficient, if I can put my mark on the world, if I can uh, be a part of this rolling progress of human history, then this is a demand on me. Um, this is a, a, an imperative to think for myself. Um, and this was a common worry at the time that, that it's hard for us to understand. Um, but we can see this in the ways that our modern ideas of stress and, and anxiety come out of that period. Uh, the word panic was used for the first time, for example. Um, Charles Beard, who um, came up with the diagnosis of neurasthenia, uh, a diagnosis that's not used today, but the historian Mark Jackson has, uh, has, has described as really being the starting point of our ideas of modern stress. Beard, at the time, in the late 19th century, thought that this anxiety um, that, was, that was overcoming Americans like this huge wave was the result of all these new technologies. Uh, watches, for example, compelled people just to be on time all of a sudden and always check that their routine um, um, was, was in unison with everyone else's. Um, the telegraph and communications all of a sudden made, meant that you can be uh, connected and, and your, your, your conversation was demanded at any minute. This was all brand new combined with the speed of trains and cars, um, you get the idea. This could have been very panic inducing time with a lot of parallels uh, with our own time. Um, so that's one way of thinking about the ushering in of modernity. Um, and I'll move on to my next video briefly in a minute, but qu I just quickly want to talk about Foucault's um, interpretation of modernity. Um, bear in mind what we've just talked about. We'll think now about the chapter in Foucault's Discipline and Punish, where he talks about these, uh, these, these approaches to being modern were taken on, taken on by the state, um, and the state used them to discipline people um, in a way that hadn't happened in the past. Um, you know, the police, the prison system, the school system, um, all these things were a product of the state's newfound desire to be a government, um, what he calls governmentality, and they discipline subjects into acting in certain ways. They compel us um, to, to live our lives in certain state-sponsored, state elite-sponsored uh, ways. And interestingly, for our own pandemic, Foucault um, talks about the plague at the end of the 16th, excuse me, 17th century in a French town, um, and uses this as really the start of a genealogy 
where you can see these modern tendencies um, to systematize and to bureaucratize and to discipline subjects come together. Um, and it's only a, a five, ten pages, but it's a great description of uh, what was happening in this play tank. Uh, he talks about how the tank was uh, partitioned um, and was broken up into quarters um, where you have sentinels um, looking out uh, from different posts, um, systems, channels of water, systems of uh, pulleys and baskets so the food could be delivered um, without people communicating, um, syndics going around, locking the doors from the outside, calling each resident to the window by name, checking them off a list. Um, he says that the gaze, the gaze is alert everywhere by men of good substance. And this is the point of it, that the men of good substance systematize and then the gaze watches over all of us in a way that commands us to act in a certain way. And he says the worry and the fact of this is that this, this would continue uh, when the plague was over, that elites would realise this was a, an efficient way of getting to pe people to act uh, in a way that they thought might be desirable. And sometimes it might be, it might be in certain types of education, but sometimes it's not. It's not about the actual, uh, the actual ethic involved. It's about the very fact that modernity can work in this way. And he uses the phrase, what's the best way of taking a theoretical ideal and applying it to bodies? Um, you know, how do you take an idea and get as many people as possible to conform to that idea? Um, and he says that this, this way of approaching the plague is a symbol of that, um, is a metaphor for that in a sense. Another metaphor he uses uh, is Bentham's, and uh, well, he used this in a, li in a literal way, but I, it can also be thought of, he means it to be a metaphor and a symbol also for the practices of the state under modernity. Um, he writes, so the Panopticon um, is a circular prison with one tower in the middle where the guard can see everyone, but everyone in the prison cannot see the guard. He writes, Foucault, Bentham's panopticon is the architectural figure of this composition. We know the principle on which it was based. At the periphery, an annular building. At the centre, a tower. This tower is pierced with wide windows that open onto the inner side of a ring. The peripheric building is divided into cells each of which extends the whole width of the building. They have two windows, one on the inside corresponding to the windows of the tower. Uh, the other on the outside allows the light to cross, from cell, cross the cell from one end to the other. All that is needed then is to place a supervisor in a central tower and shut up in each cell a madman, a patient, a condemned man, a worker or a schoolboy. Um, you know, you can see this in industrial factories of the late 19th century, in, in our school system. How do you test and discipline as many people as possible with as fewer people as possible in the most efficient way? It goes on. Hence the major effect of the panopticon to induce in the in inmate a state of consciousness and permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. So to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effect, even if it's discontinuous in action. Um, and what he means is it doesn't matter if there's someone uh, in the tower or not, because you can not see, you act in a way as if you are being watched at all times. Um, I think this has obvious consequences for today. I don't want to dwell on it too much. Um, you know, we might think or be wary of uh, the ways neo-authoritarian countries like Russia, Hungary uh, and China might use this uh, pandemic as an excuse to curtail the liberties of their citizens further. 
um, to use new disciplinary methods, um, new surveillance tactics um, um, that have come about and been justified through this time uh, later on in a time, in a more uh, peaceful time of normality. Um, you know, Viktor Orban, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, has already uh, made it a criminal offence to spread misinformation about COVID-19. Moscow is looking to track uh, all smart smartphones. Uh, Ivan Krestev, um, a Bulgarian political scientist, calls it authoritarian entrepreneurship. Um, so it's, it's uh, combining uh, new technologies together um, in a way that they can consolidate power and continue to curtail freedom. Um, so there's a lot to learn from um, how we think about modernity and people like Foucault at this time in areas like that. Moving on. So the video I'm working on now, I finished the script, um, I've recorded the script, I'm going to be working on it next week, uh, The Fist of Modernity. Um, so I think of it as a sequel to The Shock of Modernity. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope it comes together. Um, and talking briefly, briefly in it about how the new police, the police forces that we've come to know today, arose out of practices of modernity in the early 19th century um, that thought that people could be disciplined. Um, in the words of the Gazette at the time, they were a base attempt upon the liberty of the subject and the privilege of local government. Um, and that the new police forces across England were an obvious attempt to drill, discipline and dragoon us all into virtue. What we've come to think of as normal uh, in modern police forces was thought of as a base attempt on people's liberties at the time. It was a shock to people. Um, even a parliamentary inquiry said that such a system would be odious and repulsive and one which no government would be able to carry into execution. The very proposal would be rejected with abhorrence. Um, but despite this, the police force grew across the 19th century and dis despite the fact that crime and violence was declining and had been for centuries. Um, so this is what I talk about in my next video next week. Look out for that. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this brief chat. Again, let me know what you think in the comments. Please do remember to like, share, subscribe and hit that bell. Thank you all very much. Take care, have a good weekend and see you next week.